dear than we have parents. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rob Carey. I'm the associate principal. I'm going to give our team a chance to introduce themselves, and then some of them have to step out. So, want to jump in? Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Adam White, the assistant principal here at Mary Ellen Henderson. Hello, everyone. My name is oops, sorry. My name is Sia Knight, and I am the assistant director for school counseling. And I also have some eighth graders that I am a, the school counselor for. Good morning. I am Brittany Allen Shaw. I am the special education administrator here at Henderson. Thank you. We feel like it's important for all our new families to, to meet our team. So this is the team, this is the brains, and I just work here. Um, uh, Valerie Hardy, our head of secondary schools, is not here, but she sends her best. Um, and we are going to go ahead and jump right in. So this topic, I have been here for four years, and this is probably the most important topic that we present on yearly. Um, and we continue to get better and better. Our goal this year is to bring clarity to this. Um, you're going to see the, the title of this is the ABCs. One of our goals this year is to go get back to the basics. Um, Please know that the way we, we report grades is not like you receive grades when you were in high school. So um, that is probably why you're watching. That is probably why you're here. Um, so off the top, please know that this is going to be confusing and you are not going to learn everything today. But our goal is to bring some clarity as we go as we go throughout the year. So our amazing IB team, Lauren Carpell and Rory Dippold, are going to uh, jump in. Um, and I know that we have a cookie activity to get started. If you're at home, we, we apologize. Um, you do not get a cookie or coffee. Um, <laughs> so I will pass it to our IB team. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Okay. So good morning. My name is Rory Dippold. Uh, I'm the MYP coordinator. So I work at the middle school and the high school. My name is Lauren Carpel. I am the MYP specialist and I also teach sixth grade choir. Excellent. And both of us have been here for many, many years. So many years. <laughs> 15 plus, yep. <laughs> um, and we love it here, and we are excited to share um, more about what makes Henderson um, unique in this sense of around standards-based learning and grading and helping you as parents understand this process. So the goals for this presentation are to understand the basic philosophy and assessment practices that align with the middle years program um, and its connection to standards-based learning, to understand more about power school categories, to learn about how grades are reported, and then to better support um, you so you can support your children. Okay, so understanding MYP. So this is just gonna be a high level overview, knowing that in Falls Church City Schools, we are one of eight school divisions that are part of the IB continuum, which essentially means that any student who attends Falls Church City Schools are part of an IB program. So. Um, as many of you know, primary years program is at um, the elementary schools, middle years program is at Henderson and then Meridian up until 10th grade. And then we have diploma program for 11th and 12th grade. And then the career related program is new for next year and that's for 11th and 12th grade. So the IB mission, the learner profile, the standards and practices, meaning um, how we operate as a school division, they're all in alignment with the continuum. Okay, so now getting into more specifically the middle years program, you're gonna see some terms here. Um, year one, you may see, for example, that just means sixth grade. Year two is seventh grade, year three is eighth grade, year four and year five are ninth and 10th grade. So sometimes you'll see those different years and you're like, what does that mean? Again, that's just where they are in, the MYP years. Um, we have eight subject groups, which again, you can see here, um, just some terminology, just so again, there are some terminology. Um, design is kind of the career tech, like um, computer science, engineering, uh, facts. Individual and societies is just social studies, what we would refer to as social studies history. Language acquisition is our, um, languages, second languages. So American Sign Language, French, Mandarin, and Spanish. Language and literature is just language arts. And then you can see the rest there. Um, as you can see here, at the middle are the students. So for all IB programs, the students are at the center. And again, um, this is all to support their growth and understanding in these subjects, as well as kind of the approach that we take at Henderson. 
Okay, so now getting into a little bit more about how MYP works. So as teachers, and Ms. Ms. Carpell and I have gone through this process many years as teachers uh, before stepping into these roles, we've created unit planners, just like all the teachers, that encompass the standards of learning. So we are still held to the Virginia standards of learning, but we embed it into the IB curriculum framework. Um, and units are centered around investigating a topic, exploring concepts of so big ideas, understanding real world connections throughout the curriculum. So that's really an important piece of what makes IB and MYP a little different is, yes, we're teaching the content, but we're also teaching skills and big ideas and transferable knowledge as well as real world connections throughout um, all our practices and throughout all our units. Assignments and assessments are tailored to the unit. Um, so maybe you've seen already that IB provides generic rubrics. So your children have these rubrics and teachers tailor them to the specific task and student needs. So we're not just a high level overview. These are the different criterion. And again, we embed the standards of learning into these. But what you see here is that a lot of this criterion A, so there's criterion A, B, C, and D for each subject. So no matter what your students take, they're going to see um, assessment in criterion A, criterion B, C, and D. A lot of the A is knowing and understanding. So often that's our standards of learning. That's kind of the content. But as part of the IB program, we really, and this is what I loved as a social studies teacher, former social studies teacher, is that we really dive into the critical thinking skills. So investigating, communicating, thinking critically, reflecting on the impact of science. So really this tells us kind of how we assess and how we teach and how we help students really dive into the subject matter well beyond just the content, but really focus in on the skill development of our students. Okay, so now looking at it from a bigger lens, when students get rubrics for their formative, which is, um, Mrs. Carpell will talk about it, but their assessments, I'll just say that for now before we get into it, um, they get graded on a cri the criteria. So they'll score either one to two beginning, three to four developing, five to six proficient, seven to eight is their expert. So these are the ranges that students can score and for each of the criterion. So criterion A, if they're a seven, they're in the expert range. And you'll see that in power school. So we'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, so again, the codes that you'll see in power school are these codes right here. So EXP for expert, PROF for proficient, DEV for developing, and BEG for beginning. I just want to jump in real quickly. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to clarify is that if a student is achieving at a level four, <laughs> On an eight point scale, it does not mean that they received a 50%, okay? Because this is a big difference. If you see a four out of eight in a mm -hmm. traditional grade book, you're like, oh man, my kid really failed, <laughs> right? But in, in this grading system, it simply means they're at a developing level. So it is not it does not convert to a percentage. That's one key difference. So, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. And, and again, we're not converting to percentages and we'll talk more about that later on in the presentation as well. Okay. All right, so we wanted to show you today how this works in action in real life. So we have a fun activity that we were designed. And again, parents at home, so sorry, you can't be uh, enjoying this activity with us. But today we are going to assess using some chocolate chip cookies. All right, so we all have some feelings about chocolate chip cookies and what they should look like and taste like and all of those kinds of things. So we're gonna kind of put that to the test today. So. Your criteria for this activity, we, we talked about before how each subject group has four criteria. For this activity, we're going to have three. Criterion A is going to be texture. Criterion B is going to be ratio of chocolate chips to cookie. And then criterion C is going to be taste. So again, you probably have some feelings about what makes the perfect cookie. Miss Allen John disappeared. I know she has some feelings. All right. So each group is going to tackle one criterion. So we can maybe do um, the back table can do C and then this table can do B, but we're going to do criterion A together. So we're going to create a rubric together for each level of achievement, expert, proficient, developing and beginning. So we're going to do texture together. So this is where we get some crowd input. When we think about the texture of a perfect, an expert 
chocolate chip cookie. What is that like? Okay. Okay, so th maybe that goes under ratio, right? So if we think about, yes, but, but save that. Okay, crispy. Is it a crispy outside chewy center situation? Okay. All right, so now, so when we are building rubrics, you'll notice that teachers often use terminology to describe rather than a number, right? So as opposed to saying something like, um, an, the, an expert chocolate chip cookie has the ratio of 100% chocolate chips to 0% cookie, which would be ridiculous, right? They might say it has um, an, uh, many chocolate chips, some chocolate chips, few chocolate chips, right? So we use those words for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it, it, do, it helps, uh, it doesn't limit the student's creativity, right? So if you have a student who's like, okay, I have to do this to achieve a seven, that might be where they stop. Right. So, but if you use like a word like consistently or many, they're going to be like, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to keep digging in a little bit more. Okay. So the texture is um, consistently <laughs> crispy on the outside and chewy on the inside. Okay. So now if we're going, um, of course, this is not going to fit. If we go to the next level down, what is a proficient texture? So the texture is mostly crispy on the outside and and yeah maybe something like that and then the rest of it would be the same what about developing Sometimes. somewhat okay and then beginning is um Rarely is a good word. It's rarely crispy on the outside. Maybe it's just like a big pile of mush or it's like too hard and too crispy, right? So that's our kind of beginning level. Okay, so now I'm gonna give each table a blank rubric template. And so we read this table to be taste, okay? And then this back table, you're gonna be ratio, which seems perfect for you. You are ready to make that assessment. So come up with as a table, when I have multiple copies, you can have enough. Um, and I'm going to give you about five minutes to create your rubric. We may not need all that time, but five minutes to create your together. Yes, you're working together. Yes, together. Okay, so we're just taste. So what sort of expert? Yeah. Sweet with chocolate. Chocolate juice. Please. Maybe consistently. Consistently. Okay. Sweet with chocolate. Share out our rubric. So ratio criterion B. Will you share out your uh, levels for ratio of chocolate chips to cookie? Okay, sure. Yeah. Ratio. Good morning. Ratio. The ratio is uh, for an expert. Consistent. The ratio is consistently balanced. Balance, uh, consistently balance uh, chocolate to dough. Okay, I like that word balanced. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, I think most kids could probably understand what that terminology means. All right, and then your next level? Proficient, mostly balanced. Okay. Chocolate to, to cookie dough. Okay. Um, some developing is somewhat balanced, like <laughs> chocolate to cookie dough, and beginning is rarely. So that could go either way, right? So, which is important it, that the rubric is flexible. So if a kid gives you a cookie, I know Miss Mako actually does a very similar activity yeah. to this in her class. If a kid gives you a cookie that's like all chocolate chips, it's not balanced. Also a cookie that has no chocolate chips is also not balanced, right? So it can fit in multiple situations, which I really, really like. All right, our taste group. So we use similar words for each of our different levels. <laughs> We're learning. Uh, we said consistently yummy, mouth-watering, and sweet. Okay. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> Mostly yummy, mouth-watering, sweet. Somewhat of those three. And we said rarely or almost. 
yummy mouth watering. It's All right. I love it. Now I, I am gluten-free, so I will not be able to partake, but I didn't feel like I needed to subject you to a gluten-free cookie today um, because it would score very low um, and all, but I want you to taste test all three of your cookies that you have in front of you and assign it for criterion A, B, and C a level. Okay. So we have our A up here. Think about what the balance was for B and then for C, the taste. So go ahead and I'll Are give you- gonna, like decide which cookie is which? Like as far as yeah, so you can just choose, maybe be consistent large, in your group. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, let's right. do large, medium, and small. Love that. All right. Are we number scoring or just, or just terminology? Just scoring? expert proficient yeah. developing beginning. All right, give you about five minutes. Conversations that I overheard were so, first of all, you were able to really divide the parts of the cookie, right? And look at different aspects of it. So the student turns in work where one aspect of the work is a lot stronger than another aspect of the word, they're not penalized for that, right? So that's a separate thing that they need to grow on. The other thing I heard happening was people wanting to adjust their rubrics, right? <laughs> well, we didn't really define what yummy is, right? And so making the rubric specific for the students is really important as a teacher. And I'm going to be honest and say that Sometimes the rubric doesn't work the way you want it to, and you go back and adjust it for the next year, and that's okay too. But we these bolded terms that we've been mentioning, like consistently, or in your case, it might be yummy. We call those command terms, okay? So in the rubric, the, the bolded terms that are command terms, we define those for students when we give them the rubric so they know exactly what it is that they're looking for, right? So um, I, I feel like... We had a uh, back table. How did you grade your smallest cookie for each criteria? So we only, we only did one criteria. We okay. Did two. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, were we supposed to do two criteria? It's okay. Right, we don't we, you know <laughs> but you know what's really great about standard phase grading? <laughs> is Mr. Perry is not going to be penalized for his behavior. We'll just say, hey, Mr. Perry, next time. Don't forget those two criteria. Okay. Yeah. okay, go ahead. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Thank you for being an example. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we graded on ratio. Okay. And we said the little cookie um, was just proficient. We did not taste enough chocolate okay. in, that, in our one bite. Got it. Um, you want to keep going? Keep going. Okay, we said the medium cookie um, was developing. We really didn't taste enough chocolate in that bite. Okay. And the big cookie, the giant brand, was expert. Okay. It's the perfect ratio of, of chocolate to dough. Okay. Yeah. All right. How about this, our other table? Yeah. Sticking with ratio. Sure. Let's start with that and we can go to the other so two. Ratio, we thought that the small was proficient. We thought that the medium was also proficient. And then we, we thought that the large was developing. I'd like to change some more. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. So if if two teachers were working together with the same rubric, what they would do is they would sit down together and they would do what we call norming grades. So they would look at a couple of student examples and grade them together so that they were on the same page. Obviously, this is not that kind of scenario, but just so you know, that does happen with our teachers so that one teacher doesn't grade super differently than another. All right. So what about your A and C? So for... The A was our texture. Um, we thought that the small one was beginning. That one's a little crispy. Uh, the medium one was developing. And then the large one was proficient. Okay. Uh, and then for taste, our small one was also beginning. The medium one was developing and the large one was proficient. Okay. And I did hear you have some conversations about like, well, we didn't talk about like what was chocolatey enough yeah. and all of those kinds yeah. of things, right? So um, the way you word a rubric can really affect the outcome. Well, hopefully that helped you understand rubrics a little bit more. I wanted to just kind of, because I believe in throwing curveballs, <laughs> and our students sometimes do this. What would happen instead if a student gave you an Oreo instead of a chocolate chip cookie? Are you still able to give them feedback? On what? Can you give them feedback on taste? Sure, right? Absolutely. Texture? Okay. Yeah. And then when it when it comes to criterion B, uh oh, wake up, keep go. Why is it still doing that? 
Not likely. Want to help? Um, oh, do I need to start my session over? Do I have to quit? Make sure. Okay. Sorry. So anyway, yes, you can still give them feedback, but obviously when it comes to criterion B, which is ratio of chocolate chips to cookie, that's where that student's going to need a lot of work. But it doesn't mean we can't give them any feedback at all. It means actually that we can give them targeted specific feedback on their growth. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So um, we have this quote in here. The biggest shift in education is shifting from teaching kids what to learn to teaching kids how to learn. And that's really what standards-based learning and grading is about. It's giving the students the tools and the ability to be successful themselves by looking at a rubric and figuring out how to, how to get from growth to mastery. So I've talked about, I talked about this a little bit as we were kind of doing this, but, and Mr. Carey, thank you for giving me such a wonderful example here. Behavior is separate from academic achievement, okay? Where Mr. Carey might've needed a little bit of support on his uh, executive functioning, looking at directions, those kinds of things, it's not gonna impact his grade. I was still able to give him that feedback and he knows what to work on for next time. Um, the nice thing about standards-based learning and grading, and it really ties in nicely with the IB philosophy, right? The criterion that they provide us, the rubrics that they provide us, it works perfectly. And it also makes everybody's learning journey equitable, right? So a student who comes in at the developing level is still able to get the, give, get the same amount of feedback and growth as a student who comes in at a seven level, at an expert level. They're still giving that same attention and uh, differentiation as any other student. So if you watch Dr. Temples and I, very fascinating video on navigating power school, you may have heard this already, but we have three categories that we provide feedback in. Um, practice is, I, I always give the sports analogy for this, right? If your kid is playing on a soccer team, a practice is a practice. It's not necessarily tied to their uh, success in a game, but they have to learn how to dribble. They have to learn how to pass, right? They need these skills to be successful. You'll see this kind of one of two ways in power school. Number one is just a check, a green check for completion. And then sometimes teachers will actually put in a point value. It will not be on a scale of eight because we reserve that for MYP assessments. It might be out of five or out of 10, an entrance ticket, an exit ticket, just a quick check. Formatives are like our scrimmages. Right, so this is going to put you kind of in a, a similar situation to the summative, and it's going to enable to to get feedback on those skills. So formatives can uh, be assessed on multiple criterion. Hmm. Oops. Yeah, yeah. But on my computer, it's okay. It was okay. It was a little slow. It can be assessed on multiple criterion. Just one, two. This one it happens to assess both on A and C. So in our cookie example. Uh, texture and taste. Um, and then they also get the code here. So that student is proficient. Now this, this student was lovely, a six and a six on both criteria, but say for example, they were at um, a six and a three. The teacher can decide whether they really feel like that was student was closer to being proficient or closer to being developing. So that code may alter a little bit depending on where the teacher feels the student is. And that gives another layer of feedback to the kids. And then finally, we have our summative assessment. Come on, you can do it. What feedback would you give the screen? <laughs> Beginning. <laughs> so summative, I don't know why it's not doing this. Um, summative assessments can also be graded on multiple, there it is, criterion, but also just one. Now students will have multiple opportunities throughout the year, the year to interact with a criterion on a summative. So say for example, in quarter one, they, they don't do as well as they would like on the summative. By the end of the year, if they've improved, that's where they're at. So I don't know about you, but like my least favorite subject in school was math. Like I will, and my students have seen it when I try to divide them into groups, like it's a, it's a nightmare. Um, and so if I bombed that unit one test and I got a D on it, that followed me until the end of the year. And it was like, no matter what I did, I couldn't dig out of that hole, but this system prevents that from happening, right? So it's really about how far they've come. And that's what's so wonderful about it. 
or say for example the student does doesn't really do their homework for whatever reason maybe they had to babysit siblings approaches to learning skills are the skills that enable students how to learn so we report each quarter in three different categories. There's many different categories for approaches to learning skills. We report on communication, self-management skills, and social skills. Um, and teachers will often provide students with examples of what these things look like in their classroom. So communication skills, it might be something as simple as, hey, I reached out to my teacher when I didn't understand something, right? That's an, that's an example of uh, an expert level communication skill. Social skills, it's how do you collaborate in a group with other people? Um, are you a leader? Are you encouraging other people to succeed? Um, and self-management skills, did you bring what you needed for class or, and how's that locker looking, right? And are you writing down your assignments? Those are really self-management skills. And these are skills that students are gonna need in life. Like I was, my notebook is my life, right? I know how to write things to do. Like these are they're things that kids need to learn how to do. So those will also be reported on at the end of each quarter. Or can yes. you just clarify, like when we went to school, this would impact our academic yep. grade. Now it is it is scored and it is assessed, but it is separate from our academic mastery. Yeah, so it does not impact a student's final grade, but it is. Um, so yeah, there's no participation grade or discussion grade. Instead, then we're reporting on social skills, right? Or communication skills. Does this student uh, participate in classroom discussions? If not, how are they communicating in a written way? because that's another form of communication. Whereas where a kid doesn't necessarily feel comfortable always raising their hand, it doesn't mean that they're bad at communication skills. It might mean that they need a little bit more confidence in that area. And then finally, um, just a quick note about our reassessment policy. Ideally, if a student is doing all their practice and formative assessments, they're getting feedback, they shouldn't really need to reassess on the summative because that's the whole point of this process is you've gotten all the feedback throughout so that you can be successful on the summative. There are, of course, extenuating circumstances that a student may need to retake, um, but that's our general school policy on assessment. Um, if you're talking about how to help, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about how to get your help your student succeed in this system, um, and that will kind of tie back in. All right, so Dr. Dimple is going to talk about the nuts and bolts here. Awesome. So as we approach to the end of the quarter in two weeks, we wanted to give you an update on just what to expect as parents and guardians. Um, there will be, besides what um, Lauren went through and seeing on PowerSchool, the different individual assignments in the stores, you will receive um, a progress report. And that will be on Friday, November 11th. That will be communicated in the Mustang Alley the next two uh, weeks. And this just gives you a snapshot of where your child is currently at the end of quarter one for each of their courses. This will be three pages. So again, as Lauren mentioned, um, we'll have the academic um, grade, we'll have the academic classes and scores, zero through eight for each of the criteria. And then we'll also have the approaches to learning that Lauren just mentioned. And for each of them, we will have an overall current progress score. Know that this again is where they currently are we don't actually convert to a letter grade to the end of the year. So students have the entire year to grow and develop and improve their understanding of each of the criteria um, until June. So to give you some concrete examples. Poor board. <laughs> this would be an ACL. <laughs> Seven of Monday. <laughs> right now. We'll report with um, yeah. I think it just takes like a little bit. Okay. <laughs> there it goes. Perfect. Okay. So this is what you'll be seeing November 11th. Again, this will be on the PowerSchool portal. We'll kind of walk you through um, the link. We'll provide some screenshots as well. But as we've mentioned, again, using math and example, we have the four criteria. We see what they are, and then we see how the student individually scored on each of them. Um, so again, if we look at this, this is just a snapshot at the end of quarter one. So they earned a seven for A, a three for B, a three for C, and a four for D. What's nice about this as well is compared to a traditional setting, you would just get a letter grade and wouldn't know really what the student needed to focus in on or work on. But here we have very clear understanding. We have a strong knowledge and understanding of the math, of the math content. 
but they really need to work on um, patterns and then communicating, which means like explaining their answers, explaining mathematical um, terms. So, with, Rory, can I say one thing? Sure. Um, People always ask, like, like the content, right? Knowing the content, where does that fall? And that is Criterion A. So Criterion A is like the academic content, and that is what's usually easy for us to learn, right? Like we're like, all right, I can recite, I can memorize, I can recite, I can memorize, but actually communicating it, talking about it, that would fall under B, C, and D. So that's why sometimes you will see Criterion A be a little higher than B, C, and D. And there's a problem. <laughs> it gave up. <laughs> Yep. It's okay. We're going to reconnect. It's not a big deal. Next time I'll hardwire. Lesson learned. Another thing. So here's another example. Again, different subject science six. Again, you see the scores for the four criterion. Now, how we determine where the current student is overall in this course, Science 6 at this time, is um, these are all added up. So 4 and 5, okay, we see that C and D are not assessed. So teachers do not have to assess each criterion. They may not each quarter. Um, but as Lauren mentioned, again, students will have multiple opportunities um, to, to practice in the formative and then to be assessed in the summative for each of the criteria. So in this case, the student earned an overall score of a four. So you're going to see an overall current score of a four. Um, and that is based on, again, the child's prop. Okay, kick you again. So why zero through eight and one through seven? So zero through eight is what appears on the rubrics. So the students are scored on each of the rubrics, and this is how we report the formative assessment and the summative assessment. At the end of the year, and again, each quarter, they get an overall score of one through seven. And this is consistent with IB. So for example, DP diploma program and career related program, they do overall scores of one through seven. So rubrics zero through eight, it's kind of two languages, and then one through seven is the overall current progress at the end of each quarter and then at the end of the year. So, for example, we can see here again um, how students are progressing. We use this as a snapshot. They had five summative assessments throughout the year. You can see how they scored in each of the criteria. And then we have something called at the end of the year, so this is the end of the year, something called professional judgment. And that means the judgment uh, will reflect the teacher's professional opinion on the achievement of each student in each of the criteria at the end of the marking period or year. So as Lauren mentioned earlier, if you get a low score at the beginning of the year, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be averaged. We don't average them. We look at the trend. We look at kind of where the students um, end up as well. So, for example, as you see in this example, the student really trended at the end to be a six. So teachers really have to look at that professional judgment, look at the, the body of work with the summatives and make a determination. Here again, this one's pretty easy. They're all four, so it'd be a four. Here again, we kind of see where the students end up. They're more towards seven at the end. They end up with a seven. And then this is kind of the mix. So five, four, five, they end up with a five. So just like at the end of the, each quarter, what the teacher will do here is, and Power School does this for us, is you will up um, average, or sorry, add up all these scores, so six, four, seven, and five, and that will be converted to an overall one through seven score, which will convert to a letter grade at the end of the year. Corey, can you say why um, not every criterion is assessed on every summative? Sure. So just based on what the, the unit is, um, the criterion, like for example, summative assessment three, A may not fit nicely into it. And that, that's okay. That's, um, 
we don't expect all assessments to hit all the criteria. So that's going to happen throughout the year because um, we really want teachers to be intentional about what they're assessing based on what they're teaching their students. Question. Yeah, sure. So for the criterion A, you said that that's uh, usually like how much they actually know. That's that's the memorized uh, stuff. The knowledge. So yeah. the knowledge, right? So at the end, they got a six, even though like the, the assessments might be on different <laughs> topics. Mm -hmm. So what if like at the beginning they were getting sixes, and at the end they were getting twos because the just the topic wasn't you know it was hard for them sure. to learn. How, how would then um, the final uh, score mm -hmm. be determined? So I think if we saw this kind of reversed, I mm -hmm. think the teacher, that would be like a red flag to the teacher, first of all, to be like, hey, this doesn't seem right that the students stroke like a big discrepancy, like a six and a two is pretty dis pretty big discrepancy. So I'm assuming that the, the, the teacher will be reaching out if they see kind of a trend that's different um, in that case. Um, Could a teacher also look at formatives in that case, right? Formatives that have led to that summative mm -hmm. to kind of see academic mastery and maybe this extend extend you in a certain sense. Sure. Okay. Sure. Could that happen? Yes, but usually, kind of as Rob mentioned, what we see is that these are the summatives. Usually, students understand that um, the trend is like if they're doing poorly in the formative, which again doesn't count for an overall grade, it tells them where they are. That, that will help the student understand like oh i need to work on this so even if the different science unit for example the student will get that formative they'll kind of see oh it's a two what do i need to do and students usually have a better understanding throughout the year of how what they need to do in order to achieve those higher scores okay all right so i alluded to this a little bit before but conversations with your students at home about growth mindset are going to be your best um, advocate for this system. Students at the beginning of the year may not be where they want to be, especially students who are used to getting all A's or all fours consistently. This system for them might be a little bit hard to understand and to help them really focus on the feedback that they're getting from their teachers um, is, is pretty crucial. Um, and, and knowing that it is about growth and that it's not about the beginning, it's about where you end up, which is a pretty hard concept for some students to understand. I mean, as an adult, right? Like some, I'm a perfectionist, I'll fully admit this would have been really, really difficult for me as a student to buy into, but our students have, and they do, they understand that it's about growth. Um, and if there's something you don't understand, chances are, if you ask your student, they've been listening, they know how to explain it to you. Um, and I, I I had a conversation with my sixth graders the other day about this. And I was like, how would you explain this to your parent? And they they did it, right? They were like, well, and I, I only included this many markings in my final project. And something that could have helped me was to really think about the text, right? And so they're able to have those conversations. Um, and just kind of, and we do this in our academic advising time, which you mentioned during PAC. We have students check in on their progress weekly to see where they're at. And that is also very, very helpful. So encourage your students to go into power school, look for where the feedback is, look at Schoology, see if they're missing any assignments, because if they're missing multiple formatives, their chance of being successful on the summative is a lot lower. <laughs> so we have some resources for you and we will send out this slide. Go ahead. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Going back, can you go back? One. Sure. Um, one thing that I see and I know our teachers see is text, test anxiety around summatives. Um, and so if our parent community can kind of bring the temperature down a little bit, <laughs> that would help us. Um, we do not want our kids coming into this building stressed. Um, we know that that is not um, the best testing environment for them. Um, so if we can bring the, the temperature down on, on summatives a little bit, because they do see it as kind of the end all be all sometimes, and we do not want that to be the case. I know Ms. G did a, she did like a, a whole a whole presentation on how the summative is not, should not be pressure filled. Um, and so we recognize that that is the shift for kids, um, but if our parent community can help us with that, that would be great. Absolutely. That's the kind of time frame between when they do the formative and then when they do the summative. So that I'm just thinking, again, this is all new to me as far as how often do I need to be checking in with my student and checking power school and schoology and just so that I know, okay, they have, they struggled with their formative. When is your summative? Do we have time to 
kind of go back and <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I would say that's a little bit of a challenge because each again mm -hmm. that's when Mr. Kerr was alluding to that's a teacher practice yeah right so um for every teacher it's just, it's just gonna look a little bit different I, I would um, I I feel pretty confident in saying that like a teacher will give a formative in the next day or seven days, right that there's going to be several class periods that the kid can digest their formative look at the feedback reflect on it and then prepare for the summative so I would say a few class periods okay. uh, would be timing wise that's again again I can't speak to every single staff member in the building but that's what we try to achieve as a staff but Rory's point about recognizing red flags is important right that's not going to happen in every class but if it does happen in say science email the science teacher right right away like you're not going to probably not going to have the academic struggle across the board um so if you do recognize a red flag we encourage you to email the parent uh, teacher right away um to say hey when is the summative how can i support you know what is what are the next couple weeks look like etc and the teacher may provide some opportunities for the students to come in and get extra help. Like I know um, Ms. Hornigal was working with a student this morning, right? And I could hear her talking in the ball, well, if you look at your formative, and then you, right? And so those are the conversations that we encourage students and teachers to have as well. Just real quick to confirm, parents do not have access to, to PowerSchool to see all the feedback and the formative results, right? So our PowerSchool is, what we can see is different from what the students can see. No, you can see the comments and the scores. So you should be able to go in. There's when you go into an assignment, um, and I can show you not in this presentation, I'll have another. If you go into the, the course, like you click on the little eye and you'll see all the assignments, there's a little blue button. It looks kind of like a bar graph. But when you click on that, you can see the scores. And then there, if you scroll over to where the code is, there's like a little comment box. When you click there, you should see where the feedback is. Mm -hmm. Then you would have to ask your student. Like I said, so say for example, it says feedback in Google Drive, your student would then have to pull up the assignment. Yeah. Right. Um, and that, again, those are those conversations. Because there have been some times as a teacher where I've said, well, where's your feedback? Oh, I don't know. Did you look at the comment? It says it's a Google Drive. Uh, and then they have to go pull up the assignment, right? So there's a little bit of figuring out that pathway too, which are also conversations that as teachers we encourage uh, students to look back on. Um, I've also found that at the end of the week, I just selected opted in where in Schoology, I believe, I get an end of the week report, so I get a chance to see from my student, hey, you have two overdue assignments, did you turn them in? And some of them, he hasn't, and he goes in and he gets them done. It's, it's that or gaming, so he does. <laughs> <laughs> or people say, oh, I turned it in, it's just not updated yet, I've got, I've submitted it. So that which, has which has happened too. Yeah. Like a kid will say, I turned it in, but the teacher hasn't updated. I'm like, correct. We have many students that we have to update grades for. Like, <laughs> have to give a little grace there. Um, so we have some resources here. We will share these slides out in conjunction with the recording of this presentation. If you look at the standards based learning quick reference sheet, you'll see that I linked the video on how to navigate PowerSchool and have those slides as well. And if you've never registered for PowerSchool, those instructions are there. And it has the graphics that we included today, as well as some other information, including the conversion chart. Um, there are some additional resources in this presentation if you really feel like digging in more in depth about why standards-based learning and grading, why this is the philosophy that we've adopted as a school. Um, it gets a little nerdy, but like I, I like that. Um, it's totally up to you. Uh, at this time, we wanted to open it up to any parent questions that you have. We have um, some extra computers if people want to log into PowerSchool and kind of poke around. We can do that. Um, or you can take a cup of coffee to go and an extra <laughs> coffee to go. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Really, uh, the more the more people that understand this message, the better it is and the better it is for our students. Thank you. Thank you. I have to walk everyone. Thank you so much. For Thank coming. you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.